Paper was like gold in medieval times. I want tobacco. Sugar. That everything we thought we knew about the world might turn out to be completely wrong. This is the valley, a vanished world from a forgotten time. Here on the Welsh borders, a farm is being run by five hand-picked experts as it would have been nearly 400 years ago. Using only resources available in the year 1620, they are laboring for a full calendar year, turning the clock back to rediscover a way of life from an age gone by. December and it's our fourth month working on the farm. The big item this month, of course, is Christmas. And at the period 400 years ago, they'd have feasted for 12 days solid. So that means a lot of preparation work. It doesn't mean we can neglect the normal farm work as well, though. So we've got to keep a close eye on the livestock under these weather conditions. And particularly, we've got to bring the horses in. Now, at the moment, the stables is full with our spare firewood for the winter. And that means erecting a hovel to act as a wood store. So, time we got started with it. The challenge of building the wood store hovel falls to Alex and Fonz. Unfortunately, there's no kind of sort of flat pack hovel. You, you can't go out and buy one. So it's really very much a case of us experimenting with, um, with, with tim different timbers in different places and, and hopefully um, not making a mistake and having to go out and get another timber. I think that is too high because it's because we got the padstone, haven't we? Yeah. I mean, the reason why we are sitting these on the padstones is purely because it's so wet round here. These timbers will rot if we don't do this. Mm. Unlike other buildings of the period, hovels are, are semi-permanent structures, so um, they don't tend to survive in the archaeological records. We don't know exactly how they were built. We do have examples in the States. They're still semi-permanent structures that are built each year, but um, probably came across around this time with the pilgrims. We're going to have to get a sort of working height, aren't we? Some sort of... Yeah, well, six foot. I'm, you see, I'm, six, I'm six foot with heels on. <laughs> so, um, so if we take a sort of rough... Six. Yeah, if we just measure roughly on the string, then we'll bring it down. Indoors, by the fire, Chloe and Ruth are making some extra woolies, gloves and a pair of hose. I'll tell you, it's a good job this isn't exactly fine sewing. I can hardly see a thing. Yeah, me too. Well, it's never that brilliant in December anyway. So it's a sort of six of one and half a dozen of the other. Do we come inside where there's a bit of warmth so you can keep moving physically but the light's mm. poor, or do you sit outside where the light's better and freeze your fingers into little sausages? We've had a few days of, of real biting days, a couple of frosts and things like that. And the, the one main problem I find up here is the, um, is the wind, actually, because you're standing on top of that hill and that wind it cuts right through you, even wearing your woolly layers and your linens underneath. And it's getting wet feet as well for, the, for home, oh, so I find, you know, having a, a spare couple of pairs so that you can put them on once you've got wet that feet, it just makes all the difference, doesn't it? We don't have any boots, we've only got shoes on, so it's, oh... Yeah. So boys get it no, easy on that, don't they? Yeah. <laughs> There's no real records of women having boots, but it's a bit difficult to know for certain whether women in the country did or didn't. I would have felt that a farmer's wife on a place like this that was so muddy would, you know, have a pair of boots somewhere, even if she just borrowed her husband's when it was really bad. Um, I'm not far off. I've got the foot in, as you can see, and uh, I've just got to go up the back of the leg, really. And finish Cut from a thick woolen cloth, Ruth's hose are beginning to shape up. It's a time-consuming task. And so is getting the skeleton of the hovel to hold together. What we've done is we've, um, we've prefabbed some frames. There's references in the materials um, historical materials that say that you take your hovel timbers down after the end of the season and you might store them in the stable. So what we've done is we've built a frame, two pegs in, diagonally opposed, so they're taking the force both up and down. So that shouldn't go anywhere, and we've done that in eight places. When we lift this up, the movement in this plane is going to be negligible, but the movement in this plane is going to be quite intense. So that's, that's where we're going to have problems stabilising it. 
All the hovel timbers have been carefully chosen so that they lock together. You want? Come on. Excellent, OK. How is it? It's standing. It's standing free, isn't it? It is standing free. Wow. Standing well. Brilliant. We should get some braces. That was a lot easier than I expected. Christmas may be just around the corner, but there are plenty of routine tasks that need attending to first. I've started here with threshing some of the pea crop that we've harvested, still on the vine, releasing the peas onto the cloth that I've put underneath. This is one of the main field crops of the year, not as important as the grain crops, and it's the last one that we harvest, but it serves a number of purposes. We can grow this on land that's had grain crops for a number of years. It'll put some nitrogen back into the soil, refertilize the soil, and even in the 17th century, they understood that it was good for the soil, even if they didn't know the chemistry of it. I think the thing I miss most now is the waterproof clothing. You start a job outside in December, you can't finish it as soon as it starts raining. Oh. It's, it's very annoying. And you were missing your bra to begin with, weren't oh, you? Because you just yes. weren't comfy to But that was with. because I'd lost so much weight and, and it the wasn't bodice fitting. wasn't. So um, Ruth now altered it for me and it's, it's a marvellous, marvellous change. She's got lots of lovely uplift. <laughs> with the dried peas thrashed, it's time to sieve them. Nothing goes to waste. The stalks and pods left behind will make a tasty snack for the animals. It's easy for the small peas, but the big ones tend to take a bit more persuading, so... But most of the peas have come through with now very little rubbish contaminating them. These peas we can use for peas pudding, which uh, can be eaten hot or cold, and they'll be very useful for thickening up pottages, stews, things of that nature as well. So a very valuable source of nutrition on the farm. They're really interesting, the clothes that survive, and I, I find it really rather exciting when if you're allowed to get close to a piece of clothing that was on somebody 400 years ago. I mean, just how much more personal can you get than to, than to pick up a garment that somebody else wore? And you can see, like, you know, you can see, like, the sweat marks on the collar and you think, you know, that's real contact with the past, isn't it? You know, mm. that's not dry book learning. That's up close and personal. You can see exactly, just by, just by the way that we're wearing them, exactly how it would have worked. They do actually work, don't they? They do work. They're, 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 they're not, they're not costumes, costumes. Yes. they're clothes. Yeah. And, you know, it's not about looking pretty or looking silly or anything. It's about being warm, being covered, being protected from brambles, yeah. being, you know, kept out of the rain. It's about living outdoors with no heating, apart from the occasional fire, and doing this sort of physical work, yeah. isn't it? Absolutely. Look at that. With the front central strut added, really the hovel appears Fantastic. to be rock solid. The showpiece timber has worked really well. And the idea is with the braces here is just to stop that movement. So we'll put some on at the back, and I, you know, I'm, I'm fairly sure this is not... But well, you can, I mean, look at that. You can give me that quite a shame. <laughs> the pads don't, <laughs> maybe some... Uh... They're wiggling a bit. It's a new and very special day in the valley. 400 years ago, the 12 days of Christmas marked a major event in people's lives as everyone prepared for feasting. It's Christmas Eve and we're really busy. <laughs> 400 years ago, they'd have been just as busy. We've got an awful lot of food to prepare. This is sort of the main feasting season of the year um, and we're using up many of the fresh things that won't keep much longer, um, enjoying it in one sort of big, huge blowout. Um, so I'm making mince pies at the moment, and as the word says, mince pies used to have meat in them. The recipes call for either lamb or veal or beef. Um, and as we're having roast beef for Christmas dinner, um, which Chloe is boning out at the moment, I'm using all the trimmings, and then I've got all the sweet ingredients ready. Now, these are exotic imported ingredients, really quite expensive in this 400 years ago. Um, so they're really only reserved for special times like Christmas. So I've got raisins of the sun here. These ones are currants um, and dried figs, which I'm going to mince up and add in um, with the minced meat. Oh, well done! <laughs> Finally! Oh, that looks really good. You've got most of that off nice and most clean. Of, do you want to have a hack at that? Yeah, I'll just take, put it, pop it on there and I'll take Oops. all the extra bits of meat there off. There you go. Outdoors, the boys are rushing to finish the hovel. 
Most of the firewood has been moved out of the stables, but the roof still needs some work. We've bracken thatched. And the reason we've done that is because obviously we've taken all of our season wood out of the stable and we need to make sure that uh, we keep the majority of the rain off it. And I think that's working um, fairly well. But uh, we've been generating quite a lot of new green wood recently. Uh, so I've really just got to crack on and make sure I finish this end of the hovel. The wood we're putting on here has got no other use. It's so grotty than firewood. The birch has all been stacked elsewhere because we're going to only use that in the water coppers where it doesn't get smoke in our eyes. In the main room, that would cause absolute sort of tears all over the place because it's very acrid. Here, there's oak, which gives you a really lovely uh, warm flame. There's a certain amount of ash coming up. Now, that's beautiful because you can actually burn that green. You don't have to wait for it to season. But that would then go on the ready-to-use pile. But keep off the elm. They say at the period it grows like graveyard mould. <laughs> so uh, you won't get much heat out of that. Oh, oh you're yeah. star, thank you. Like that that should be great. Yeah. Back in Stuart times, roast turkey wasn't the prime ingredient of Christmas dinner. Goose was a common favourite. Oh my God, that's and in a well-off farmhouse, beef was often the centrepiece. In the 17th century, spices like cinnamon and pepper and nutmeg and so forth all had to come from the Far East in the most amazing trading voyages. And as a result, they cost an absolute fortune. Got some mace here, which is the covering that you get around nutmeg. I'm going to pop a little bit of that in. Ooh, it smells good. <laughs> Freshly ground, so much better than buying it pre-ground. Here we are. I'll just tip that in there. How are you getting on over there? We're done. We're just done. tying these off. Oh, just fantastic. Off. Um, where do you actually want this? Well, if you pop it in the dairy and put a cloth over it, ready, and then we'll... Be well, ready for tomorrow. Rack, yeah. Find a place for that. So we've just got to do the rice for the rice pudding. It's got to go on to boil. We've got the peas to boil, um, ready for the peas pudding. And then we're just about done on this, and we can get on with the big job of decorating the house, ready for Christmas. One of my favourite things to do on Christmas <laughs> Eve. <laughs> for the hovel roof, the boys have been busy over the past month harvesting bracken. With the skills he picked up thatching the cow shed. Alex is using bracken as the top coat of thatch over bundles of twigs called faggots. It's important, obviously, to get as steep a pitch as possible because we want the water to run down the bracken. It's good fun, this. It's, um, it's working big. It's like big sculpture. You know, you've really got to just hit it hard. Obviously, paying special attention not to, to fall off the roof as I did the other day. The problem is, is because we've had a few frosts, it has, in fact, it's got a lot more brittle. Um, so it's really scratching the hands. And the major concern is it is thinning out as well. So I'm getting my excuses in early. To be brutally honest, I'd give my right arm to pop down the DIY store and get a roll of felt. Oh, lovely funds. Oh, this is looking much better now. I'm a lot more, a lot happier with this. For people living on a 17th century farm, religion was the truly dominant factor of Christmas. Much of the seasonal paraphernalia we take for granted today came in much later. One man who can help the team rediscover a Shakespearean-style Christmas is Ronald Hutton, a leading expert on Tudor and Stuart society. 400 years ago, people went to church on Sundays and at the great feast days like Christmas for the simple reason they got fined if they didn't. Now, this wasn't particularly to keep them pious. It was to make sure that they weren't Roman Catholics or forms of radical Protestant who represented actual enemies the Church of England. It's a political business. But that at least meant everybody turned up. Behind the Christian feast of Christ's birthday lies a massive range of prehistoric pagan festivals celebrating the rebirth of the year and the sun, the winter solstice. The Anglo-Saxons called it the Mother Night, Modernicht. The Scandinavians, that's the Vikings to us, called it Yule, which is of course a term we imported. It's the same primitive instinct of getting worried as the daylight and the warmth goes and the trees shed their leaves around you. And the same urge to celebrate once you realise a turning point's been reached. No matter how many of you are going to die before the spring comes, it's on its way. Done. There's a bit of a shallower pitch up there, isn't there? Yeah. So what do you think? I think it's very good. I think because you're done, I think. 
<laughs> a poorly built house. <laughs> Back in the age of Shakespeare, there was no such thing as a Christmas tree, mistletoe, or fairy lights. But decorating the house was still a big affair. Christmas Eve in a farmhouse about 400 years ago was one of the most exciting times of the year. It's the beginning of the biggest holiday of the year, 12 days of eating, drinking and making merry. And the last four weeks, which is the season of Advent, would be the time of the last hard work of the entire year upon the farm. And also of uh, drawing your belt a bit tighter, cutting down your food in order to save up the real grub for the holiday. So people be living on porridge, uh, living on bread and cheese, hard work, lack of excitement, a bit of malnutrition. So on Christmas Eve, the good time's finally coming. Let's face it, midwinter, left to its own natural devices, is a pretty depressing time of year. It's when there's least greenery, fewest flowers and blossoms. What do you do? You turn your home into a garden. You bring in the symbols of life and you put them up. Holly and ivy, the obvious favourites, they're most common. But also, they've got rosemary, wonderfully scented. Wow. And bay leaves also, with their own more subtle scent. We know about these because they're celebrated in the poetry of the time. Robert Herrick, the greatest lyrical poet of the early 17th century, saying, bring up the rosemary and the bays. So this is a kitchen that's going in for Christmas big time on Christmas Eve. Let that one drop, because it just pushes it. Yep. And then if we suspend it, because we've got the nail there, haven't we? All the firewood has been stored in the hovel. But there is one very special item that needs to be moved. Nowadays known primarily as a chocolate dessert, 400 years ago, it was brought into the farmhouse as a central part of the Christmas festivities. OK, coming through. This is a better fit. <laughs> wow. The Yule log is the exact 17th century equivalent to the modern Christmas tree. It's equivalent because, like the Christmas tree, it's just come in from Germany. The Christmas tree arrived in the 19th century, the Yule log probably in the 16th. Just as everybody naturally gathers around the tree these days, everyone gathers around this gigantic log in the burning hearth in the early modern period. And getting it here is a considerable physical feat in its own right, requiring all the lusty men of a household. And having made the struggle to get it here, traditionally they're welcomed with hot spiced ale. There's a poem which goes, Bring with a cry, jolly jolly lads, the Christmas logs, the firing, while my good wife, she, bids ye all be free and drink to your heart's desiring. Yes, please. Here we go. You deserve this after that. That's enough. Let's stop. <laughs> <laughs> OK, gentlemen, let's give this some hob nail. <laughs> What's ale? Drink ale! ale. <laughs> Indeed. Oh, that's delicious. <laughs> Fantastic. It's Christmas Day in the valley, but there's no time for a lie-in. Before preparations can begin for the big feast, the animals still need to be tended to, and the fire lit early so it's hot enough to spit-roast yeah. the beef. No! Oh, oh, it's a piece, isn't he? So it's much easier with a piece that's boned out. Beautifully boned out. Beautifully boned out. Is that on? Yeah, I think that's oh, it. That it's starting to wrinkle a bit, isn't it? Yeah. Here we go. Oops. Oh, oh. go for that spike. Sorry. In order to make sure that it cooks nicely and stays moist, we shall keep basting and dredging right through the roasting process alternately. So you put on a baste give it 10 minutes or so, and then dredge it with breadcrumbs. Um, and it'll build up a crust around it, which seals all the juices in, makes it really tasty. I have to say, oven roasted meat, I have got a thing on spit roast meat, as long as you do it properly. With the beef slowly cooking, Chloe and Fonz can check up on the livestock. Some of the cows in the valley are pregnant, and the team are keeping a close eye on them. One is looking especially close to term, the leader of the herd, Duchess. She's looking huge, but we're not too worried about her because she's had plenty of calves before and uh, she shouldn't have a problem with this one. She should, hopefully, just drop it in the middle of the night and we'll come down one morning and find it sitting there on the floor next to her. But we are going to supplement her diet um, with basically a high-protein feed that we're going to make up from things like turnip heads, rolled barley, and then we'll start the battle of pinching the milk. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The Duchess is a big cow. I mean, she's had so many calves over the years that she's got sprung ribs. 
So uh, it makes her appear pregnant all the time, actually. With the beef roasting well, the team can get on with the other dishes. Stuart is making a period-style chicken pie. How's that water doing? Is it 400 years ago, chicken wasn't a very common meat, so it would have been a special treat. We know that on this farm, part of their rent was to pay a fat hen at the Feast of the Circumcision, which is the 1st of January. So they definitely had chicken around at the time, and it's Christmas, so hey, if they had a spare one, they probably went for it and had one themselves. Now, I need to mix the first layer of the pie, which is the dried fruit. And we've got raisins. Now, we know they were importing these from places like Malaga. I've seen account books from the 1630s for a farmer on Anglesey where he trots off usually about mid-December and raisins are one of the staples he buys year after year. Are we ready on the pie case? Uh, just about, yeah, just come about. on then. This is the base layer. Fills in there. Now, to keep the flavour really rich and sumptuous, although it's not actually an expensive ingredient, plenty of butter. This will just melt and soak into the dried fruits. And we then add in... Let's hope it's going to fit. We're going to pop some more butter on top, otherwise it'll be all yeah, dry. We've got at the, the top. spices to go on top as well. A right. bit more dried fruit. Sort of conspicuous consumption, really, this, yeah. isn't it? <laughs> Most of the year, all the food is really very local. But uh, this time of year at Christmas, you know, you're sort of bringing in foods from all over the known world. Like many pies of the time, the casing on this one is disposable. It's the goodies inside that are all important. I think these cows are doing remarkably well overall. I think they're. They seem very happy. They're an incredibly friendly little herd, actually. They've really bonded as a herd. I mean, yeah. Duchess is the leader. Oh, yeah. What she says goes, really. And this is Sweetheart. This is Duchess's calf that was born in April. And you can just see the horns coming through here. I mean, I was always under the impression that male bulls had horns. Uh, uh, watch it, Tom. But apparently, it can be either sex, and the calf will have horns if the mother did or if the father did. I have come to like cows. I mean, they're docile animals, and so am I. And um, <laughs> we got on very well. It took a little while. I mean, I was a bit apprehensive at first. I mean, they are big animals, but they are very, very gentle. I had one major problem with this cow. I was feeding her, and she thought I was definitely not feeding her enough. <laughs> and she turned around, and uh, I got the, the end of one of those right between the two big muscles on the side of my thigh. Um, I had a bruise for about a month off that. The crust of the beef is building up well, but it's not just hot dishes that the team are cooking up for dinner. One of the other special dishes we're going to do for this meal is a grand salad, uh, aping what the gentry would eat on a regular basis for their feasts. Now, the core of the grand salad, and it's going to be a bit like a bullseye with concentric circles, we have a mixture of dried fruits. Into the pot go some olives, almonds, some chopped figs, and lots of currants. Currants were such an important part of cuisine for people who could afford them that just over 20 years later, when the Civil War broke out, the import of currants was banned by Parliament because so much money was leaving the country to buy them that they needed to keep in there to pay the troops with. There we go. Not the neatest of jobs. Hang on, just pinch him round. This pie looks about done. Yeah, so it looks really good. Chloe! You can take that out and pop it in the next to the bake oven, would you? Yeah. Thank you. And, and then slight variation on the modern mince pie. Mainly being about 20 times the size. And uh, she looks quite good. I'm surprised, but it does look quite nice. I hope. I hope it tastes as good as it looks. Back in the hall, the last thing needed is the salad dressing. We're going to use two exotics here. The first one is sugar. Now, this would have cost around about sixpence a pound. Now, that's at a time when a labourer's earning about eightpence a day. Sugar loaves like this were generally imported from Morocco. Next ingredient is what they called salad oil in the period. Olive oil from the Mediterranean. Come pass me that sugar, could you, Stuart? I could. Thank you very much. And last but not least, we've got a large apple pie. There we go. I'm going to take this straight out because it's actually quite hot. 
if you look at gentry menus, you find that many of their dishes are purely for display, and the appearance and the layout and the colour in a dish like this is in some ways almost as important as the flavour. Um, I suppose if you had it on a daily basis, you'd be showing you had all this spare labour, wouldn't you? All this time <laughs> that you could just let your servants go and do useless prettiness as opposed to doing useful work. And for people like this, it's just nice to have pretty food once or twice a year. To drink with our Christmas dinner, we're going to have lamb's wool, which is beer, and um, you put apple in it and then let the jug sit by the fire and just warm through so that the flavours mix a little bit. Is it just apples in there? Yeah, it's just apples. And I think we just need something to top this up. A sprig of rosemary. All the finery would have come out for the Christmas dinner. Best linens, plates and glasses. They'd have even brought out their best candles. Expensive scented beeswax instead of the usual tallow. How many pies we got on the table? One, two, three, four, five, yeah. Beef. Five pies. Yeah. That's, that's nearly one each. Just like today, Christmas in the 1600s was all about hospitality. So the team have invited over Keith Paynes, the Thatcher who helped them build the valley's cowshed. No, no, you're supposed to eat it. The team have cracked open their finest period tipples, like Whiskerbeth. You start off with any raw spirit. Mm. And then you put in about ten ingredients. Uh, there's licorice and aniseed and sugar and right. spices and dried fruits. And all you do is you stir it once a day for ten days. Yeah. And then you decant off the liquor and don't dry for three days. Cheers. 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 Oh, happy Christmas. Cheers. Yeah. Cheers. Well, well, a Merry Christmas. Indeed. And a Happy New Year. New Year. <laughs> and a, and a successful it? first four months, I think. Yeah, yeah. not gone bad, is it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah fair play. Cheers. So is it what? Cheers. Oh, wait, wait, wait. What's ale? Oh, what's ale? Drink ale. Drink ale. Drink ale. Drink ale. What's ale? What's ale? What's ale? I think you can pay me for the thatching with this. <laughs> so this is the mincemeat pie? This is the mincemeat pie with real meat in it. Can I try a little bit of yours? Yeah. 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 No, I haven't. This tastes just like modern mincemeat, doesn't it? Yeah, it does, doesn't it? I know, it's not quite yeah. sweet, is it, really? I mean, it's not quite sickly, but... That's nice, I like that. Chicken pie! Chicken pie! There's a luxury for this time of year only. Oh, God! Bones in there. Mm. Yeah, but the, the bones aren't as hard as the pie crust. <laughs> 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 oh, yeah, mussels, mussels. <laughs> Did Fonzie crush it in his hand? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> did he? <laughs> hey, I got it right! I got it right! Yeah. Okay, time for the ball. Yeah, it's head in hand, yeah, 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 yeah. etc. That Ta -da! deserves a man of applause. Fantastic. So this is a... It's a march paint. You know, almonds and sugar. Mm. Takes hours. So what do we do? Just... Eat him. <laughs> Fonzie's got the pig's ears. <laughs> oh, Alex didn't seem to have too much. <laughs> 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 my nose! My nose! My nose! I'm going to have the other ear. <laughs> well, merry, merry be, in spite of all our woes. And he that will not merry, merry be, will pull him by the nose. Let him be merry, merry, merry there, while we're all merry, merry here. For who shall know where he may go to be merry another year, brave boys? To be merry another year. Next time in the valley, it's January. The team resort to some period medicines to beat the aches and pains. They stock up on winter wood supplies, and they get some surprisingly acrobatic help with hedge laying. <laughs> <laughs>